So I've finally gotten around to moving all of my components to the new O11 Dynamic Mini, and in the process, I've done a few upgrades. I might eventually get around to building a custom loop in here, but I'm pretty happy with performance, which we'll see in the benchmarks later. Building in this case was a treat, but I had to get a little creative with some of these components. But before we jump into the creative DIY or any benchmarks of this build, let's talk about the parts. For the GPU, we have the NVIDIA RTX 3090 Founders Edition. I know most people will probably ask how I got this, and it's sort of a weird story with this one. I was aiming for a 3080, but ended up trading one of my camera lenses and cash for the 3090 earlier this year. The CPU is the Ryzen 5950X, 16 cores, 32 threads. It's dropped into an Asus X570 Dark Hero 8 that is not only aesthetically pleasing, but it also comes with some additional features like Dynamic OC. And as far as I know, it's the only X570 motherboard that got rid of the chipset fan and opted for passive cooling. Speaking of cooling, the 5950X is nice and chilly under the Kraken Z73. It's a 360mm AIO and I've swapped the fans out for some Lian Li Uni fans. This is mounted at the top of the O11 Dynamic Mini through some creativity and zip ties. For RAM we have 32 gigs of Corsair Dominator Platinums running at 3600MHz with those juicy Capellix LEDs. Storing the OS and relevant programs is a 1TB Sabrent Rocket NVMe and I have another 1TB Samsung 970 EVO Plus for games and other storage. Powering everything up is the Corsair SF750 Platinum Power Supply. I was pretty close to pulling the trigger on a Cooler Master V850 for some additional headroom, but read some issues about the fan ramping up and down, so I decided to stay away from it for now. All of these parts are installed in this beautiful all-black Leon Lee O11 Dynamic Mini. Like I mentioned earlier, this case was super easy to build in, but it doesn't officially support a 360mm AIO up top when using an ATX motherboard. So I had to get a bit creative with this part of the build. I ended up ordering a couple of brackets off of Amazon and zip tied the AIO at the top of the case as a workaround. This is a tight fit and surprisingly stable, but watch out for RAM clearance if you plan on doing this with your O11 Dynamic Mini. A big shout out to the poets for this idea. I'll leave a link in the description below to his original video if anyone wants to check that out. I really wanted a full size ATX board and didn't want to sacrifice any cooling so this solution worked perfectly. I also installed a 14 inch portable monitor at the front panel of the case. It's sitting nice and snug between the front fans and front tempered glass panel. There's an upward angle mini HDMI to HDMI adapter plugged into the monitor and feeding to the GPU to get an output. It's a completely overkill solution to monitor thermals and truthfully, this is mainly a choice of form over function. Although you can technically use it as a regular portrait monitor to read Twitch chat or even casual gaming if you want an all-in-one PC. I added three more unifans at the bottom to feed some fresh air up into the case for additional cooling to the GPU. Then added a couple of 140mm unifans at the front of the case to intake more air while the AIO takes care of the exhaust. The front fans are double sided taped to the case since the screws don't line up properly with the monitor installed at the front. The fans are all plugged into a Lean Lee fan hub hidden in the second chamber of the case controlling the RGB and speeds. With all those fans, we're able to hit some pretty solid temps on the GPU and CPU. I have my GPU undervolted with a pretty aggressive fan curve, while the Z73's pump runs at a constant 2700 RPM, and those fans are on a curve based on liquid temps. Here's what that sounds like while running Heaven 4.0 at 4K. After running Heaven 4.0 for just one hour, the 5950X averaged just over 70 degrees Celsius with a max temp of 78 degrees, and the 3090 averaged 63.5 degrees Celsius while peaking at just under 65. Moving over to Cinebench R20, we get a multi-core score of 10,711 and a single core score of 635. In the newer R23, we're seeing a multi-core score of 28,706 and a single core score of 1684. When it comes to gaming, I ran benchmarks for games with built-in benchmark tools, and for other games like Warzone, I played 5 games at each resolution, then took the average of those games for each resolution. Let's start with CSGO. This game was interesting because it has a built-in benchmark where we see an average of 649 FPS at 1080p, but the 5 game average of Dust2 came out to 478. 
Same goes for 1440p, we're seeing an average of 551 in the CAN benchmark, while the five game average at Dust2 averages 367 FPS. This will definitely vary between maps and really makes me appreciate the time the bigger channels put in while getting these benchmarks. Onto Rainbow Six Siege, I ran the CAN benchmark for this game and we're seeing an insane frame rate throughout all resolutions. At 1080p on the highest settings, we're seeing 547 FPS. At 1440p, we're seeing an average of 445 FPS. And even at 4K, we're pushing an average of 241 FPS. There's no CAN benchmark for Valorant. So again, I played five casual games per resolution at the highest settings. And again, we see that this setup is quite overkill for these eSport titles. Same deal with Warzone, no CAN benchmark here, and the different areas of Verdansk will yield higher frame rates than others, so I try to land in various places in five different games to calculate these averages. At 4K, we're seeing a very playable average of 109 FPS, while at 1080p, this combination of hardware can net an average of 203 FPS. These benchmarks were taken at the highest settings with ray tracing on, and running on lower settings will definitely give you a boost in FPS and a competitive advantage. As you can tell, I love my FPS games and in Apex Legends at 4K highest settings, we're seeing 134 FPS, while at 1440p we see an average at 191 FPS and an uncompromised 246 at 1080p. Similar results in Overwatch, we're seeing an average of 110 FPS in 4K, 233 in 1440 and 274 at 1080p. We'll finish off with another built-in benchmark in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. This game supports DLSS, so I ran the benchmark with it on and off to see what the improvements would be. There's a 13% improvement with DLSS on at 4K with minor bumps in FPS at the lower resolutions. I managed to get my hands on a 6800 XT and plan on doing some comparisons between AMD's FSR and Nvidia's DLSS, so hit that subscribe button if that's a video that you'd be interested in. All in all, this has to be one of my favorite builds I've ever done. It's definitely the most aesthetic and overkill PCs I've built for myself with performance that is really out of this world. Editing and exporting videos has never been faster. Uncompromised gaming on 4K is crispy clean and immersive. And I've even been able to muck around with Unreal Engine with no hitches. If I were to do this again, I would opt for some components that use a single piece of software to control RGB and fan speeds as opposed to having a variety of bloatware installed. Currently, I have NZXT Cam, Corsair IQ, Lean Lee L Connect, and Asus Armory Crate to control the different RGB and fan speeds. If anyone has suggestions on consolidating this process into one software, then please let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, thanks for watching, we'll see you in the next one, and later days.